Come on, Bobby. It's time to forget about it. She came back to you and will never change you again. You were together for 15 years and have two wonderful children. You don't want to ruin it all, do you? If you divorce her, she will get your boys and you will both live in poverty. Getting back together is the best thing for your entire family. I don't know what was uglier, a fat slut talking, just deal with it, or what she said about forgiving her sister for fooling around. This wasn't just a case of her getting drunk at a bachelorette party and having sex with an old boyfriend. This was a nuclear incident, and the punishment had to be carried out. My problem was that if I had been the one to press the red button, the nuclear fallout would have affected me much more than anyone else. No one else has lost as much as I have, and this fat woman lecturing me didn't help my mood or my ability to make a perfect plan. That's where I was, me, Bobby Smith, sitting on a pontoon boat on the lake with the three of us, this bitch, her loud-mouthed asshole husband, and my cheating wife. As a Kansas native, I had no intention of swimming 300 meters to shore, an Olympic challenge for a plainsman. In 10 minutes, I was going to shut them up and give my wife an unforgettable reminder of her infidelity. Now a little about me, the poor bastard who found himself in the middle of this shitstorm. I grew up in Wichita, Kansas, the self-proclaimed air capital of the world. Boeing, Cessna, Spirit, Beechcraft, and Embraer all have manufacturing plants in this industrial city. My performance at school was average, but that didn't bother my parents. Mom was addicted to strong drinks, smoked, spoke rudely, and had many different men. My father actually thought he was married when they got together. My older brother and sister, who supposedly share the same father as me, couldn't handle the fights, insults, and 911 calls from concerned neighbors. They left the same day they graduated from school. They wished me luck and never looked back. My teachers told me I was smart enough to get good grades, but I felt there wasn't much sunshine in my future. At least I waited until the morning after school ended to leave the house. My first and only stop was the U.S. Army Recruiting Station. Because I did well in my workshop classes, I signed a contract to become a wheeled vehicle mechanic. This was one of the first times in my life that it seemed like there was something positive in my future. For others, the Army salary of a private is mere nonsense, but I felt like a king. My platoon sergeant liked me because I didn't cause problems, did my job well, and got along with the other guys. We drank and partied for two years. After finishing my military service, I decided that I wanted to return to Wichita and work in one of the aircraft factories. I went to the National Aviation Training Center to get the specialized training and education needed to land one of the best jobs. My major was aerospace manufacturing and technology, which is where I thought I would excel. Cessna was my first choice for the job and I was happy when I was hired. Six months later, I was helping a friend build a workshop in his garage when I had an accident that changed my life. I wasn't happy about it at the time and scolded my buddy for missing out on his metal roofing piece. This mistake resulted in a large cut on my chest. When I first looked at the wound, I called out medic and then laughed because I was no longer in the army. My friend applied a rag from the workshop to the cut and we went for medical help. There was a dock in the box about a mile away and he drove his pickup there. What happened next changed my life forever. The most beautiful nurse who ever walked the earth walked into my room. She was tall, well-built, with shoulder-length dark hair, and her smile lit up the room. Her badge said, Nursey Anne. Looking at my soiled things, she turned her magnificent blue eyes to me and said with a smile, I didn't know they were auditioning for the TV version of Jack Butt today. I don't know anything about this because I was busy doing it alone, building an orphanage while healing cancer. My injury is the result of a metal sheet being torn off from the roof, caused by the cheers of the Mensa Society celebrating my achievements. She smiled slightly, smirked, and laughed at my comment. It's only 10.30. How much beer have you already drunk this morning? Not one yet, but it depends on how long it takes you to get me in order. After all, you can't drink all day if you don't start in the morning, I told her. Looking through my card, she asked, As I understand, do you also smoke cigarettes? To her. 
You look a lot like my brother, she muttered. Do you love your brother? She took a deep breath and said, Yes, but there are days. So there is hope that I can invite you somewhere, since I look so much like your beloved brother. To which she replied, Ha, please take off your shirt. I have more important work to do than spend time with an asshole like you. It was difficult to pull the shirt over my shoulder. She cut the shirt, but not before shaking the scissors at me as a threatening gesture. Without saying anything, she began to wipe everything off my chest. My height is 183 centimeters, weight is 86 kilo, mostly muscles. I think that's what made her spend more time cleaning me than I expected. She giggled as I reacted painfully to the disinfectant alcohol that was generously sprinkled on my wound. I would have thought that she would carefully tell me, it will sting a little. She walked away to the door, turned to me, pointed to the examination table where I was sitting, and said sternly, Stop! Just for a second, I saw her smile. A few minutes later, Nurse Anne and the doctor returned to the room. I read on her face the concern that I would continue to be obnoxious and embarrass her. If I wanted to get anything out of her, I had to become a better patient. Answering questions, I said, Yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, doctor. I was pleasant and obedient no matter what they said. While the doctor carefully examined my wound, she stood right behind him. I winked at her, and she smiled. While the doctor stitched me up, I looked at her, watching the doctor. From time to time, she looked up at me, smiled, and looked at my chest again. After Anne had applied the bandage, the doctor said to me, No strenuous activity, keep the wound clean, and make an appointment in a week for Anne to have her stitches removed. Great, I'm looking forward to meeting her. He laughed, she blushed, but I was happy. Grinning, he told me, We need to clean this room in three minutes. Can I count on you two to finish whatever you need to do during this time? Yes, sir, I answered, but Anne said nothing. She simply smiled. What time can I pick you up for dinner today? I said with a smile. She thought for so long that I thought it would lead nowhere. Then she said, At seven in the evening. She had a funny look on her face as she asked, Red pickup? Yes. It's decided. And she left the room. I went home to get myself and my truck in order for the evening. I was dressed in clean jeans, a fresh cotton shirt, and good leather shoes. Anne would be shocked and disappointed if I wore anything better than this. Her outfit was identical to mine, only she looked much better in her skinny jeans. More men looked at her cotton shirt than mine. She knew the kind of footwork required for a five-foot-ten woman to gracefully climb into a pickup truck. After an initial period of awkward silence, the conversation continued throughout the evening. We both told stories of our lives up to that point. She was from a small town in southwestern Kansas that I had never heard of. Her parents and brother began farming and ranching there. I rarely traveled outside the city, so I could only guess what was there. It was already dark when we left the Mexican restaurant. I asked if she had seen the Guardian of the Plains statue on the rivers. She had no idea what I was talking about, so I took her to the confluence of the big and little Arkansas rivers. Where these two rivers meet in downtown Wichita, artist Black Bear Bosin created the 13.5-meter-tall Keeper of the Plains statue. Indian legends say that this place was a gathering place for various tribes for powwows. Mushers on the trail, Chisholm kept here Longhorn before live cattle were loaded and shipped to Chicago for slaughter in the 1870s and 80s. I knew this from visiting the cow town in Wichita that framed 1870s Wichita. At night, it was an impressive place with dramatic lighting and a bridge over the rivers to symbolize the bow and arrow. She lived in Wichita for several years, but had never been here. We stood on the river bank and admired the view and all the families who were there for the night's event. I kept my eyes on the clock, and when 9.44 p.m. struck, I moved to stand next to her and hug her. She accepted the offer with a grin and a wiggle. At 9.45 p.m., seven fires in the river exploded with a huge roar and ten-meter gas flames rising into the air. This made Anne jump into my arms. She trembled with surprise and fear. 
That was until she felt me holding her tightly to my shoulder. She looked up at me and said, You knew this would happen, didn't you? Yes. You don't have to scare me into hugging you. Just ask and I'll happily give you a hug. She grinned. With that, we shared our first kiss. When the bonfire show was over, we walked back to my truck holding hands. I walked her to the door of her apartment, made sure there was no one else in the apartment, then turned to leave. Do you want to stay a while? She asked timidly. I want to stay here for as many years as you allow me. But I think it's best for me to go home after our first date and start looking at my calendar. I need to schedule all the times we can be together over the next month. Anne stepped towards me and hugged me. She pressed herself as close to me as she could and said, It was a special night for me. Be here tomorrow at 6.30 for dinner. The next evening I arrived on time, carrying red roses for my new girlfriend. She opened the door to show off a beautiful yellow dress, the color of the sun. She had a funny look on her face as she said, These flowers are good, but I'm already leaving on a date with someone else. I don't want to be late. Could you put them in the water? Yes. And close the door when you leave. Goodbye. She then ran out the front door. I saw the flowers wither in my hand. What's going on here? I found a vase, put water and flowers in it, and went to the door. When I opened the door, Anne was standing there, laughing at the look on my face. Yesterday you deceived me with the fires on the river. Today I caught you. Are we even now? I think so until next time, I said shyly. She took my hand. Come in. I hope you like what I prepared for dinner today. Before starting dinner, she offered me a choice of wine or beer. I chose beer. We laughed about last night and how much we enjoyed each other's company. We both knew where we would end up later that evening. It was a room adjacent to the living room. A soft lamp was already glowing on the night table. It is unlikely that this was because the cat was afraid of the dark. She was so nervous that she kept apologizing if I didn't like the food. Finally, I grabbed her hands and said, Stop it. I like the food and the way you prepared it. Never apologize until I say what I don't like. But remember, if your hands touch it, I will like it. Fine? This made her feel much more confident and happy with my presence. We had a great dinner, laughed a lot, and discussed the things that are important to us in life. After dinner, Anne said, Why don't you sit on the sofa while I clean up the kitchen? As requested, I sat down on the couch for about ten minutes. Then I stood up and walked up behind Anne. She didn't jump or move away, so I guess she didn't mind. I brought my face close to her to smell her hair and said, You smell really good. She turned to face me. Thank you. When she turned around completely, she said, You won't let me finish washing the dishes, will you? No. In a whisper, she asked, So what activity will replace washing dishes? Let me look for an idea. We had sex. Then she said dreamily, Bobby, you're not my first, but you were definitely my best. More importantly, I want to be your last. She smiled slyly. I like your thought process. So, when will my next last be? Tonight or tomorrow morning? I hit my chest. Both. For the next three months, we were together every evening and all weekends. It was time to meet her parents, and I felt a little awkward since I didn't really have any family in my life. I felt almost like I was in an orphanage, so it could be an interesting weekend with her family, which spanned several generations on the same ranch. The plan was to leave immediately after work on Friday afternoon and return to Wichita on Sunday evening. I started my pickup and asked Anne for directions to her family's ranch. Drive west from Wichita two and a half hours to get to Wyatt Earp Boulevard in Dodge City, she said. Continue west on Wyatt Earp until you reach El Capitan. It's a bronze longhorn bull in the middle of the street. At El Capitan, turn south, left toward City Boys. If you drive past Boot Hill, you've gone too far. Once you head south, keep driving until you cross the Santa Fe Trail. From there, turn west off the paved road and wake me up. You're making fun of me again. What are these instructions? Where is the address I can connect my GPS to? Why aren't you awake to guide me? Bobby, 
These are directions and landmarks on how to get to the ranch. You can handle it. Wake me up when we're south of Dodge City. With these words, she pulled the pillow towards her and laid her head. Of course, there was a smile on her face. For the next two and a half hours, there were very few traffic lights. I used each one to stretch and move around to keep my legs from getting numb. Two and a half hours later, I saw the lights of Dodge City. I drove past two huge slaughterhouses and several large concrete elevators until I saw a street sign that said, Wyatt Earp Blov D. Damn, her instructions had been right so far. A few blocks away, in the middle of the street, stood a statue of a longhorn bull. This is crazy. Now I need to find a sign saying Santa Fe Trail. It seemed that she was still sleeping, but I did not believe it. She's too much of a perfectionist to let me roam the prairie trying to find a hundred-year-old cattle trail. I stroked her carefully. Come on, wake up before I end up in Oklahoma. Okay, Bobby, where are we? She said, as if she was really sleeping, but I doubt it. Oh, okay, here's Miller's place. There are only three miles left to go. She began combing her hair and fixing her makeup. We turned off this gravel road to the sign for Clear Creek Ranch, EST 1872. A ranch-style home came into view, as well as several buildings, corrals, and barns. A couple in their fifties came out of the house to greet us. Anne fussed when she saw her parents in the yard. The pickup barely had time to stop before she jumped down and ran to her mother to hug her. By the time I arrived, she had already hugged her father and kissed him on the cheek. Mom, Dad, this is Bobby Smith. Bobby, this is Pat and Bill Green. I took off my baseball cap and shook Bill's hand, and Pat gave me a big hug. We went to the house to have dinner. Anne went with Pat to finish her work in the kitchen. I was left with the unenviable task of talking to the father of the woman I had been dating for the past few months. Of all the women I've dated, I've never been around them long enough to get to know their parents. For me, it was a new experience. It's a long drive from Wichita, Bill said. Would you like something to drink? Tea? Water? Beer? Whiskey? Or bourbon? Cold water followed by a cold beer would suit me very well, sir. You don't have to call me sir, Bobby. To everyone here, I'm Bill. When Bill returned, he said, Anne's brother Gary is not here today. He was supposed to attend a cattleman's meeting in Dodge. You will meet him tomorrow. Gary is single and lives in a mobile home on one of the other ranches. Since I had nothing to offer in terms of family, I started asking questions about the photos and items in the family room. Bill turned out to be a walking, talking history book of the Clear Creek Ranch. It was founded by the Pat Carter family. They were cattle ranchers and had one of the first brands recorded in this county. Their mark consisted of two letters C standing back to back and was placed on the right thigh of the unfortunate cow. The Catcher and Green families have long resided in the area. There were pictures of old guys and gals everywhere, and they all had a connection to Pat or Bill. Both Bill and Pat came from large families, so Anne had many cousins, nephews, and nieces. There were photographs of Wyatt Earp and his brothers, as well as Betta Masterson and Doc Holliday. These were actual photographs that the family acquired at the time, not reproductions. Bill's grandfather was featured in several of these photographs as a bystander. He had a receipt signed by Wyatt Earp for the gun he bought from Earp after the marshal made sure the bad guy would never need it again. What interested me most was the collection of Winchester Model 1873 rifles that stood in a gun chest on the wall. It was the rifle that conquered the West. Their families used these guns to shoot coyotes, cattle thieves, horse thieves, bandits, and Indian posse. This was more exciting than dinner, but Bill and I decided that we would continue our journey into History Lighter. If only we knew what was good for us. Over dinner, I was able to listen to the story of Pat Carter's family, which coincided with the story of Bill's family. It was very interesting to hear this information about Anne's genealogy. It was late when Bill said he needed to go to bed so he could get up early the next morning. This was the same minefield I had feared. Where would I sleep? Am I being too presumptuous to think I'll sleep with unmarried Anne? Anticipating conversations, I said, 
I'm going to get the bags. This way the greens will decide where I sleep. The trouble was that by the time I returned, they had not yet decided my fate. They ignored the question about Bobby. Then I leaned forward and said, Bill, isn't this the cowboy barn next to the barn? When I was little, I wanted to be a cowboy and sleep on bunks. Would you allow me to fulfill my childhood fantasy by allowing me to spend the night there? Pat responded, Oh, you can't sleep in that old place. The bed has noisy old iron springs, and you won't be able to get a good night's sleep. Maybe not, but it's not often that I get to fulfill old fantasies. What time do you want me to return to the house? She shook her head. Breakfast starts at 8 a.m. See you later, I replied. Then he took his bag and walked towards the house. Come on, I'll show you the way, Bill said. Bill and I commented on the beautiful sky dotted with stars. There is not much light pollution here. After we entered the house, he showed me the arrangement of the bathroom and said, Bobby, you don't have to stay here. You can stay with Anne if you want. Sir, I have not earned the right to sleep with your daughter under your nose in your house. This room suits me quite well. During my military service, I stayed in much worse places. That'll suit me. Bill smiled, shook my hand, and walked back into the house. Pat was right. The bed was terrible. But I was tired and happy with my life. There was no air conditioning in the room because here in the high plains, summer nights drop to 15.5 degrees, although during the day it is almost 37.7 degrees. The windows and door were open to let in a fresh, cool breeze. I quickly fell asleep, but woke up when I heard a strange sound. I heard the groan of the spring opening the door and then soft footsteps approaching the bed. Clothes fell to the floor. Now I recognized the outline of a body approaching me. Damn, I was going to surprise you. You surprised me? I'm surprised you waited so long to get out here. She laughed, making a sound that made my heart ache. Bobby, you really impressed my mom and dad tonight. They really liked you, especially for dad, since you voluntarily agreed to sleep here. If you had demanded to sleep with me, he would have sent you here. And since you voluntarily agreed to sleep here, he doesn't mind you sleeping in the house with me. Since this is my first meeting with your parents, I will stay in the house. I didn't just tell the story of my childhood dream of spending the night in a cabin. As a child, I wanted to be a cowboy. It was a salvation for me to imagine myself in the Old West, and not with my terrible parents. Photos of your family in Dodge City with Wyatt Earp and others were amazing to me. When I saw the house, I knew I had to spend some time with the happy part of my childhood. I couldn't see her in the darkness, but I heard, Now, let me give you a few more happy minutes of your life. We made love. Gradually, the light returned, and she moved away from me and put her head on my shoulder. I love you so much, Anne. It's amazing. And I love you too, Bobby, more than I thought possible. She laughed. Will you stay with me until the end of the night or go back to the house? I'd better go back to the house. I just had to come here and confirm to you how much I love you. I've always been a good girl and made my parents proud, so I'll try to make them think I'm still a good girl. Oh, you are a good girl. Very good. Good night, honey. See you at breakfast. It was a wonderful remedy for insomnia. My eyes remained open until I saw her leave through the door. After the first blink of my eyes, I fell asleep. That was until the sun woke me up, jumping out from behind the barn and peering through my open window. The water heater in the bunker was not turned on, so I started the morning with a bracing cold shower. After changing into jeans and a t-shirt, I went outside and heard some noise which I assumed was coming from a metal equipment shed. I saw a young man trying to change a large inner tire on a large truck. So, as not to surprise him, I said, Good morning. Hard work to start the day. Good morning. This bastard is giving me no peace. Can I help you? I've already done this kind of work. He quickly replied, Of course. Sit on the other side and we will lift it. Then I'll tighten the nuts. Working together made this a short task, and we finished quickly. When we got out from under the truck, the second guy said, Thank you. I could do it myself. 
but I would be exhausted by the end of the day. I'm Gary. Glad I could help. I'm Bobby. Bobby? I thought your name was Mr. Wonderful from all the comments I heard from Anne. Gary smiled when he said this. I laughed at Gary's comments. I don't know why she says that because she is much smarter than me. If you don't believe me, just ask her. Gary had a good laugh at that. He asked, if you don't mind, can I ask you one more favor? I need to deliver this one LN8000 to the workshop to repair the hydraulic lift before harvesting. Only if I get my ass back here in time for breakfast at 8 o'clock. Great, do you want to go to Dodge in my truck or yours? Gary replied. Why don't I go in this big car? Give me the address and I'll go to town. I'm sure you have other things you'd rather do than drive to the workshop in the morning. I jumped into the cab, started the 300 HP diesel engine, drove out of the engine shed, and headed to Dodge City. I kept an eye on Gary during this process as he clearly had no confidence in my ability to control this beast. The radio was already tuned to a local western music station, so I had time to soak up some local flavor during the trip. Gary left the farm later than me, but we arrived at the repair shop almost simultaneously. On the way home, he said, Thank you for helping me this morning. Otherwise, I would have to call one of the hired workers. You really know how to drive a car like our Big Red. Where did you learn this? I served in the Army for two years as a wheeled vehicle mechanic. We had to have a license to drive all the cars we repaired. How do you use this truck? From the last week of June to the first full week of July, we use this truck to transport wheat to those huge white concrete elevators you saw when you entered the city. We have to hire local people to drive the grain trucks so that my father and I can keep the combines running. Anne takes the day off to help her mother prepare food and distribute it to all the workers scattered over ten miles. He continued, Since Anne will still be working here, would you like to get a job as a grain truck driver for us? The pay is lousy. The cabin has no air conditioning. The temperature is about 38 degrees. We work 16 hours a day. But the food and the feeling of accomplishment are great. Coming from you, that sounds like a great job. How can I resist? And we both laughed. Gary wanted to know how airplanes were made, and I asked how wheat was grown. We got back to Clear Creek Ranch at 7.30 a.m., and I washed up in the bunkhouse and went to the main house. Everyone seemed to know that Gary and I were going for a little walk. I see you met Gary this morning, Bill asked. I'm surprised he let you ride into town on the big red one. He takes great care of this truck. Only the most experienced driver can get behind the wheel while harvesting. Yes, he told me how it was used during the wheat harvest. Hey, Anne, I was offered a new job this morning. She looked at me. And? Yes, I will drive the big red during the harvest. Should be fun. What do you think? Does this fit into your plans? She laughed. So my brother told you that I will be here cooking and delivering food to the harvest workers? And you think you're so smart? After a short prayer, our breakfast was worthy of the physical work these farmers do every day. Halfway through the meal, I noticed Pat and Bill glance at each other. Bill cleared his throat and asked Anne, Are you having trouble sleeping lately? I thought I saw you sleepwalking last night. I saw Pat start to giggle and Anne blush. She continued to stuff scrambled eggs into her mouth so as not to say anything. She looked at me, expecting a smart remark, but I just shrugged and grinned. Anne put down her fork. I was worried about Bobby being moved to the employee's room. There might be spiders there because no one goes there anymore. Besides, Bobby forgot to kiss me goodnight. When she finished speaking, everyone, including me, laughed. Anne, too. The rest of the day, Anne and I spent in different places. She went with Pat, and I went with Bill. Since I had expressed a desire to be a cowboy in my youth, Bill drove me around the Clear Creek Ranch. Clear Creek Ranch belonged to the Pat Carter family. Bill and Pat then acquired parts of other ranches as they became available. There were 3,000 acres of grass, grass that was native to the Indians and bison that dominated the area. They had 250 black cows that were on pasture all year round. Each fall, they bowed another one-thun heat of steers to finish during the winter and early spring, then shipped them to commercial feedlots. We rarely drove on paved roads between ranches. If we came across another pickup truck, 
We made sure to stop and discuss the weather and the livestock market. It was obvious that Bill enjoyed this life and was very successful in his responsibilities. When we got back to the ranch, we saw Gary in the machine shed. I lit a cigarette and went up to talk to him. He looked at my cigarette. You know she's going to make you quit, don't you? Yes, we have already discussed this. We are now at the negotiation stage. And how does this happen? He asked. My grandfather was in France during World War II and traded cigarettes for sex with women. I use this as a guide to action. Do you think this will work? He smiled. You don't stand a chance, buddy. You're doomed. Since you have a full pack and I am banned for life from purchasing any tobacco products, I am forced to smoke a cigarette from you. I really started to enjoy being with Gary. A barbecue was planned for the evening at a neighbor's ranch. There was a huge grill set up in the backyard, and as we drove up to it, it looked like an Indian camp with all the people crowding around and the smoke from the fire. The rancher prepared delicious steaks, and all the women brought their best side dishes, including Anna. Games were provided for small children, and a concreta slab left over from an old building blown away by the tornado became a dance floor. Three generations of the same family could be on the dance floor at the same time. I danced slow numbers with Anne, and for fast dances I headed to the water tank filled with beer. Several young men kept her active during fast songs, rocking her like a doll. When the songs changed from fast to slow, these rude people grabbed her and wanted to dance close and slow. Every time this happened, she would push them away and wave her index finger for me to come and dance with her. It was a wonderful evening. We were all to red when we got back to Clear Creek Ranch. I kissed Anna goodnight and heated into the cabin. I could hear Pat and Bill giggling, teasing Annie about wanting to sleepwalk again. An hour later, I woke up to the door of my house slamming shut. This time, Anne did not get dressed on the way from her bed to the house. We made love again. Can you go back to your room or do you want to stay here with me? I asked her. I'll stay with my man, as much as I can. And she fell asleep in my arms. Early in the morning, Anne returned to the house without anyone noticing her. Breakfast was back at 8 a.m. and everyone around was looking smug. There was no comment about how someone was in the dream or whether they were asleep at all. The breakfast menu included bacon and pancakes. I was the last to be served and everyone watched as a plate of pancakes was placed in front of me, as well as a thick steak. Bill grinned. I think you need this, son. Everyone except Gary laughed, but I'm sure he'll hear the story later. We attended mass as a family. I was accepted like a member of the family. The way they treated me, I felt like this was the family I always wanted to be a part of, an orphan who found a family that loves and accepts him. Late that evening, Anne and I headed back to Wichita with bags of food and great thoughts about our weekend. There was no sex, because we were too overzealous. The only thing we changed was that I moved into her apartment, another step towards becoming a permanent family. Three weeks later, we went back to Clear Creek Ranch. Once again, we were greeted with open arms and welcoming smiles. When I carried my travel bag into the cabin, I laughed heartily. The old iron bed was replaced with a new double bed with a mattress. There were nice curtains hanging on the windows, and a water heater was connected. On a small table there was a vase with sunflowers and a note. Welcome home, son. The main purpose of this trip was the chaos that is wheat harvesting. Within two weeks, farmers harvest crops planted last fall. It was necessary to have time to collect the grain before the thunderstorm destroyed the crop with hail and wind. Gary and I spent time working out the logistics to get Big Red into the right fields at the right time. We were ready to harvest, and thanks to everyone's efforts, there were no major mechanical failures. Everything went well. All the workers remained safe and sound, but by the end of the work, they were exhausted. At the end of July, we were able to return to Clear Creek. We spent Friday evening with our family. On Saturday, I helped Bill and Gary clean and repair the equipment and vehicles used in the wheat harvest. After dinner, Anne told everyone that we were going on a night hike to see the Persid meteor shower. Of course, I had no idea what we would do, but whatever it was, we would do it on a horse. Anne saddled her bay mare, and I got to mount Bill's chestnut gelding. Anne saddled both horses and we mounted them and began to move down the driveway. After a mile, 
Anne stopped at the gate, dismounted, opened the gate, and motioned for me to let both horses through. She tied both horses to the metal gate and said, Please take off all your clothes, put them in the saddlebag, but put on your boots. Who am I to resist such a request? I was the lucky one. We followed the car path through the grass. I constantly moved my horse from behind, then in front, then next to Anne. We stood on the north-facing hillside and looked down at the bucolic view in the moonlight. There was no one around for miles. She opened the bedding behind the saddle, took out a fresh blanket, and laid it out for us. She turned to me. On our ranch, this is a special place. Here the great-grandfather found springs to water his cattle, thanks to which the family was able to survive. Water bubbled from springs in the rocks. My father laid a pipe, and water flowed into this water tank. The Indians also considered this place special. Even though my great-grandfather owned this land, he never forbade the local Indians from coming here. Twelve local cattle breeders took one fat bull to a small Indian camp once a year. They also hired some Indians to help gather livestock in the fall to move them to winter pastures. She continued, Tonight, we will watch the Persid meteor shower, which passes every July and August. While we lie here, we will be able to see from 30 to 90 shooting stars. This is an ideal location because there is no light pollution. I have been coming here for this spectacle at least once a year since I was born. Mom and Dad also come here on horseback and talk about all the family members who have been here over the past 130 years, she said. I told the family that we would come here so that we could have the opportunity to be here together. You are the first man I brought here. Thank you for the honor. This is truly a special place. I didn't plan for this, but it's much better than I could have imagined. We turned to face each other, sitting cross-legged. And, taking her hands, I said, Anne Green, will you make me the happiest person in the world by marrying me? She rushed at me like a snake attacking a prairie dog, fast and deadly. I'll marry you, Bobby Smith. Anytime, anyway, but I will definitely become your wife forever. As we lay holding hands and looking up at the sky, wondering what our lives would be like, she jumped up and screamed, Look! I saw thousands of stars, but not what she wanted me to see, so I stood behind her as she pointed to two unusually bright stars next to each other. Beneath these stars, there was a U-shaped cloud, it was a giant, smiley face emoji. Anne took this as the universe's approval of our engagement. After a few minutes, the clouds moved away, but we stayed there to enjoy the beautiful sight. Anne, please excuse me for a moment. She gave me a curious look. I stood up, walked over to my horse, opened my saddlebag, and took out a small box. It's very difficult to hide a velvet box from a woman when you're both naked. She identified it before I even returned to the blanket. I opened the box, and the diamond sparkled in the light of all the shooting stars. Needless to say, she was delighted with the ring. Smiling, she said, You'll have to ask my father if you can marry me. I already did this today. Didn't you see how he beamed during dinner? Laughing, she exclaimed, I thought it was because Mom put her hand on his leg. We lay down on a blanket to enjoy the experience and the view. After a while, she stood up and said, Shall we go and freshen up? She started to walk away, and I followed her. I was pleased to follow her. In the middle of the pasture, there was a container with cool, clean water. She swung her foot over it. Get in. The water is good. The water was clear, and the fresh water bubbling up from the ground was cold. The splashing of water by my bride was invigorating and refreshing. It didn't take long to determine that we were clean enough to get dressed. We held hands as we drove back to the barns. After the horses and equipment were put away, she decided to spend the night with me in the cabin. Before breakfast, she extended her ring finger to everyone who looked in that direction. The mother shed tears of joy, and the father puffed out his chest. Gary was happy for both of us. With the engagement, the months-long process of planning and taking into account, the smallest details for a successful wedding began. I felt very sorry for Pat because my mother was not present during the planning and execution of the wedding.
The wedding took place at nearby Church Green. It was not a very large building, but there were many friends, neighbors, and relatives who were expected to be invited. Gary was my best man, and three buddies from work were my best men. With Anne at the altar stood four of her cousins. Bill asked the ushers to seat the guests on both sides of the aisle so as not to draw attention to the absence of my relatives. The wedding went off without a hitch, and everyone had a great time. My work buddies enjoyed dancing with their attractive cousins, Anne and Gary. Two days later, we boarded the Amtrak Southwest train in Dodge City for Santa Fe, New Mexico at 5.55 a.m. The week spent there was wonderful, both in the hotel room and on the street. From there, we began to live like any young married couple. That was until that fateful Saturday afternoon a few years later when I received a call from the city police. Anne was in a serious car accident and was in the hospital intensive care unit. I called Bill while driving like crazy to the hospital. It wasn't fair of me, but I had no one else to talk to about it. The doctor told me she was in critical condition, with severed damage to her heart and major organs. He allowed me to visit her for a short time so that she knew that I was there and wanted her to live. She opened her eyes when I called her name. I told her that I was nearby and that her parents were already on their way to see her. She grabbed my hand and didn't let go until the nurse made me leave. Pat and Bill arrived in record time two hours. I immediately led them into the room, although this meant that I would have to leave. All we could do was wait and pray. All night the three of us swapped places so that someone was always with her. The next morning we met with the doctor and he gave us the bad news. Her kidneys failed, causing most of her other organs to fail. He apologized that there was nothing they could do except keep her comfortable. Does she know about this? I asked. The doctor sighed. She is a very good nurse. She kept me on my toes all the time. She knew what her injuries would lead to. Pat gasped. Bill turned his face away and tears soaked my shirt. She will probably die today, said the doctor. So I allowed all three of you to visit her at the same time. Bill went outside to call Gary and ask him to come over immediately. Pat and I hugged until it was time to wipe away our tears and go to her room. I entered her room and was greeted by a weak voice. Hello, cowboy. I am glad you're here. There is no better place than next to you. At that moment, Bill entered the room. Hello, princess, and kissed her forehead. I'm glad you're all here, said Anne, because I only have the strength to say this once. I'm so glad I lived this life with you three. You are all so special to me and I love you all. Listen to me. It is very important. I don't want you to feel despair and depression about me leaving you. Please remember about me only those moments when we had fun and not that you miss me. I know that you will keep me in your hearts, but do not ruin the future by mourning the past. Bobby, you are my one true love. I want you to fall in love again, get married and have the children you talked about. Please do this for me. Remember, I will always be a part of you. I will always be with you. I will become your guardian angel until you join me. Mom, Dad, thank you for everything you did for me. I love and cherish you. Please do me one last favor. Please take care of Bobby. You are the only family he has now, and I don't know how my boyfriend will cope without me. I'm very tired, so let me take a nap for a few minutes, and then we can talk again. She squeezed my hand to let me know she was still with us. Her sleep was not restful. She kept moaning and muttering something. About mid-morning, she squeezed my hand tightly and let go. The muscles in her face began to sag, and there was no life in her hand. She was no longer there. We asked the doctor to disconnect her from the monitors so as not to suffer from her death, and he agreed. The three of us stood and hugged without saying anything. I walked away from her to tell the nurse that it was all over. We divided her ashes into three parts, one to be buried in their church, one to be scattered around the main house at Clear Creek Ranch, and one jar to be combined with mine and scattered in her special place on the hillside. It was a solemn event, and the church was full of people. I still remained in the barracks while we worked out all the details. I took an extra two weeks of bereavement leave from Cessna and spent it at the ranch. 
I returned to work just to reset my mind and focus. I traveled to Clear Creek every weekend to help Gary work on any projects that required additional labor. This was very good for my mood, as I almost felt that she was standing on the porch watching us. Most often in the evening, I went to a special place to sit and communicate with those spirits who were listening to us. I became more and more involved in the Green family's social activities. We celebrated Easter Sunday at a special place as it was the perfect place to watch the sunrise. I celebrated Mother's Day and Father's Day with Pat, Bill, and Gary. There were a few neighborhood barbecues that brought back fond memories. Gary invited me to join him and his friends for the first day of pheasant hunting in November. Gradually I moved on, but not because I wanted it, but because I needed it. Anne wanted me to move on. Christmas and Thanksgiving were hard for all of us. But by the end of the holidays, we were back to normal. Gary would come to Wichita every few months, and we would go to parties. A year and a half after saying goodbye to Anne, Gary and I were at a Western bar dancing in Wichita. Two young ladies, stylishly dressed in short Western skirts and cowboy boots, walked past us and smiled. We put away the glasses of stale beer and invited them to dance. Thanks to Anne's advanced training, I now had the chance to avoid embarrassing myself on the dance floor. Gary and I spent the next hour with Shelly and Katie. I'm with Katie and Gary is with Shelly. Katie went to the toilet and Gary went for a drink. Shelly hugged me and said, Dance with me, please. Certainly. And we went on stage to a slow song. I don't really like Gary, Shelly said, and Katie says she doesn't mind being with him. I know we just met, but can I spend more time with you? How can I say no thank you to a pretty blonde like you? Don't tell Katie, but I still preferred you. It was Gary's turn to be the first to choose the cute girl to pair with. And that's how it happened. Shelley laughed. I traded him for the guy with the biggest bullshit, didn't I? Yes, but I look better and dance better. We spent the next few hours talking, drinking, and dancing. I took her phone number and asked if we could have dinner on Sunday night, and she agreed. Gary had a good time with Katie and maybe they'll meet the next time he's in Wichita. It was obvious that Katie was not going to go to Dodge City to meet him. That Sunday, Shelly and I had a lot of fun. It was a little awkward when she asked how I knew Gary. I told her that he was my brother-in-law until my wife died in a car accident. He is a good friend of mine, and I go pheasant hunting with him every fall. She was sympathetic to my situation, and we didn't talk about it anymore. We followed the usual relationship path. We had a midweek date just to do something together. We had a regular Saturday night date, dinner, a movie, and a little dancing. Then we added a Sunday to drive around, talk, eat ice cream, or something simple but healthy. We enjoyed every second we spent with each other. It didn't take long before she moved in with me. Now she was my love and my world. She didn't mind my week-long trips to Clear Creek to help harvest wheat and hunt pheasants. It even helped our relationship as we both realized how much we missed each other. We had so much in common that we quickly became a couple. She wanted to have at least two children, just like me. She wanted to have a nice house after marriage, just like me. Shelley worked in the accounting department of one of the hospitals. She had some education after high school, but not much. Everything was fine in our world until one day I came home from work and she was sitting on the couch crying. Please forgive me, Bobby. It was a mistake, and I can't take my words back. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. I didn't like her words. What did they mean? I was afraid that I would lose another lover. I forgive you. Now tell me what you did was so terrible so I can kiss you and tell you it's okay, I said. No, you will kick me out of the house. Please, I love you. Please stay with me. About ten more minutes of crying about this inappropriate event passed before I simply said, That's enough, tell me now, or I'll go to the bar. Drunk people understand better what people like you were talking about, so speak up now. I'm pregnant, Bobby. I'm sorry we talked about waiting until we got married, bought a house, and got settled. I ruined everything. Please forgive me. I was surprised because she was taking pills. Well, apparently it didn't work. My hands cupped her face and I pulled her towards me. I have two questions for you. Think before you answer. 
I won't let you come back later and change your story. Are you ready? Yes, she sobbed. Okay, listen carefully. Shelly, I love you very much. Will you marry me? It took her a moment to realize what I was asking. Then she asked, Aren't you angry at me for getting pregnant? Do you want to marry me? Oh, Bobby, I'd love to marry you. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you so much for not being mad at me for getting pregnant. I am very happy to ask you to marry me. I want to live with you and love you forever. And now my next question. She had already stopped sobbing, but continued to make funny wheezing sounds. Can we name our baby Carter? I just love this name, whether it's a boy or a girl. She hugged my neck. I like this name too. We will have such a wonderful life with our baby. The next two months passed in a whirlwind of events associated with the wedding and the birth of a child. Everything she planned for both events was appropriate and within a reasonable cost. There were no diva outbursts in our apartment. The only problem was her asshole sister, who always insisted that everything be done the way she wanted if she was in the same place. She told Shelly that I had to spend three times my full month's salary on her ring. I told Shelly it would be great if we could move into her sister's house for three months and not have to pay rent, food, or a car. Her sister Beth, the bitch, didn't think this was an acceptable solution. Her husband Hal didn't help either. He kept harassing me with talk about how cheap I was and how good he was for paying four months' salary for Beth's ring. I know how he paid for the ring. He racked up a bunch of credit card purchases, including a ring, then filed for bankruptcy and walked away laughing at how smart he was. The only disappointment in the wedding came from her parents. They wanted to throw a big party to impress their friends, but they were very insistent that they not pay a penny for the event. So Shelley and I had the wedding we wanted for ourselves, and not for anyone else. Gary Green was my best man again. Pat and Bill were invited and enjoyed attending the event. I was very happy to see them. Our Carter was born on March 3rd and was a healthy, happy boy. Shelley was the perfect mother, knowing exactly what to do and when to do it. I just did what I was told, except I didn't have to be told how to hold, love, and care for him. In June, we brought Carter to Clear Creek Ranch for the start of the wheat harvest. I agreed on this with Bill and Pat before we arrived. During the phone call, Pat had an emotional moment when I proudly announced that our son had been named Carter. Shelley only met Bill and Pat briefly at our wedding, so this was her first real encounter with them and the ranch. The plan was for Shelley to return to Wichita the next day while I stayed behind to help with the harvest. As we approached the ranch, Pat almost ran over Bill and Sir Henry's dog to get to Carter. She hugged Shelley first and then carried Carter into the house. Although Shelley was a wonderful mother, she was willing to have another woman help with her son. Neither her sister nor her mother wanted to do anything other than coo to the baby and then ask Shelley, Do you have anything to eat or drink? Pat did a good job of not overstepping the maternal boundaries reserved for women to care for children. Pat fed Carter and rocked him to sleep, waiting for him to fall asleep. Shelley took this opportunity to ask me, Can we go for a walk? Of course, I answered wondering if something had happened. Shelley took my hand. I just want to take a walk with you, you and me, just on our own. I love my son, but I like spending time with his dad. She continued. Pat is simply fascinated by Carter. You might think that this is her own grandson. In fact, this is her only grandson, if you consider that I am still her son-in-law. I consider her the kind of mother I have never had. She and Bill treat me like a son, and I love them like parents. Their daughter is no longer in my life, but I am in their life and they are in mine. Of course, I consider our relationship first of all. I hope you are not worried about my relationship with them. After a couple of steps, she said, It seems to me that you maintain balance. We walked for about an hour. Then mom's alarm clock went off and we returned to the house. Everything was quiet as Carter was asleep and Pat was working in the kitchen. Bill and I went to meet Gary and discuss which fields we would start working on the next morning. Bill and Pat took turns holding and feeding Carter until he fell asleep. 
Shelley couldn't believe how dark it was night until I looked up and saw a thousand stars as we carried Carter to the bungalow. We were surprised to see a brand new children's bed in the room. On it was a blue blanket with a picture of boots, a saddle, and horses for our little cowboy. It was a message that Carter could come and visit them at any time. Shelley returned to our house after dinner. She had planned to leave after breakfast, but she and Pat started talking and the time flew by. I stayed at the ranch for a week, and then Gary drove me back to Wichita when I went to the John Deere dealer for parts. Two years passed and Shelley gave birth to our second son, Tyler. Pat came and stayed with us for a few days, happily caring for Carter while Shelley was with Tyler. As the boys got older, we spent more time at the ranch. They were old enough to ride horses and understand the old cowboy stories Grandpa Bill told. Wessex of us went to Boot Hill, where they rode in a horse-drawn carriage, watched a shootout on Front Street, and drank sarsaparilla at the Long Branch Saloon. We took the boys to the pasture west of Dodge City so they could see that the wagon ruts of the Santa Fe Trail still carved the land. They enjoyed living surrounded by cowboy history. Every summer, we allowed the boys to stay for a week or two. They became friends with the neighborhood kids and rode their horses to each other's houses to socialize. Pat and Bill took them to Sunday school, and this increased their circle of friends. The longer they stayed at the ranch, the more they wanted to go back there. When they were 10 and 12 years old, they wanted to spend the whole summer at the ranch. We compromised and allowed them to spend the month of July on the ranch after the harvest. By this time, Shelley was already tired of life on the ranch. It was fun at first, but it was hard work and not much fun. All month, while the boys were at the ranch, she wanted to dance and have fun every evening. She was getting closer to that magical Big 40 mark and wanted to imagine turning back time. She returned to work and had a group of young women to socialize with. That fall, I took Carter on my first annual pheasant hunt. He had never seen ring-necked pheasants and was eager to join his friends. There were ten people in our hunting company. Eight men walked across the field to lift the birds, and two at the far end blocked the field so that the birds would fly up in front of the shooters. The boys walked next to and behind their fathers. After lunch, the boys were taught how to clean and dress birds. Each boy made himself a headdress of long, colorful tail feathers to wear in the evening. We ate about a third of the bird that evening and froze the rest and took it home. Carter brought home some beautiful feathers for his mom to make into an arrangement. Shelley was unimpressed and the feathers disappeared, much to Carter's disappointment. The following summer, the boys made a big offer to spend the entire summer at the ranch. They told Shelley and I that we could come whenever it was convenient for us. Shelley didn't like this plan. She wanted the boys to stay in Wichita, but didn't feel the need to spend much time with them. She worked during the day and went out with friends several times a week. She was out the door at 7.30 a.m. and might not be home by the time they went to bed. Therefore, one can understand their dissatisfaction with the current situation. Shelley and I had some disagreements about her being away from home. I had no reason not to trust her when she was out with friends, but I didn't think she should be spending all that time with those friends. Pat called me while Bill was driving her and Gary to Wichita. I realized she was upset, and then she told me that Gary was very sick. All his life, he suffered from kidney stones. Chronic cigarette smoking worsened the problem. It got to the point where he developed end-stage kidney disease and needed a kidney transplant. I learned that he had been on the kidney transplant list for some time, but none were suitable. I knew he had this problem, but he didn't show that it was a threat to his life. They wanted to meet me when they came to town. I walked into their doctor's office and asked to be tested to see if I could be a donor for Gary Green. The next few days were very stressful for the family. The boys were very worried about Uncle Gary. Finally, as Gary's condition worsened, they decided I was perfect for him. The transplant was scheduled for the next morning. I visited Gary that evening, and he was overwhelmed by the opportunity to receive a transplant and move on with his life. He thanked me profusely, and I told him that this proved that we were siblings, although we had different parents. The next morning, we were taken to the neighboring operating rooms. I told him, see you on the other side, when we were separated. I didn't know that when Gary was brought into the operating room, his heart had stopped and the doctors were unable to restart it. 
My surgeon had already made the first cut to remove my kidney when he was informed that the operation was canceled. When I woke up, Pat and Bill were in my room, and I asked, Is Gary's operation over? Pat started crying, and Bill stood up and took my hand. Gary died of a heart attack on the operating table. Doctors said there was nothing they could do because his kidneys had stopped functioning. The fluid entering the lungs and heart was the final blow. We all cried until the nurse came to give me sleeping pills. On a bright sunny day, every ranch for miles attended Gary's funeral. Shelly, the boys, and I sat with the family in the front pew. Shelly took the boys home, and I stayed at the ranch, recovering from the interrupted operation. Gary was preparing to take over the ranch, so Bill had to do more work. I was going to be at the ranch most weekends to help him. Shelly did not like this decision, as she wanted to maintain her social life with friends rather than take care of two active boys. We disagreed, but did not engage in critical debate. One afternoon, she came home from work and was as happy as a schoolgirl. At work, she was appointed as her department's representative on the employees' committee. No extra pay but prestige and the opportunity to do something else. The hospital had a connection with a famous football player who was due to come to the hospital to lead a fundraising effort to build a new children's wing. Because Lance Belton regularly traveled to Wichita to maintain his Cessna Citation aircraft, his agent agreed to have Lance come forward and encourage donors to donate to the hospital. Belton was a linebacker for the Oakland Raiders and had a reputation as a dirty player. Of course, so did every Kansas City Chiefs fan in town. At lunch, Shelley got to sit at the head table with Belton. She was also part of a group that took him from room to room in the hospital so he could see his children. As his citation sat on the Cessna runway, I walked over to where his plane was departing for Los Angeles. I saw Shelley and her friends fawning over Lance, and he, enjoying it, kissed and hugged all her friends. I tried to get closer but they wouldn't let me in because the jet engines were ready to start and people were being pulled back. Lance hugged Shelly and kissed her. He took her hand and began to pull her towards the plane. She resisted, but her friends pushed her forward all the way to the plane. Lance picked her up, placed her on the first step, and began pushing her into the plane. Those bitches laughed and clapped as she was pushed into the booth. The door was closed and the engines roared to life. There was no way I could get to the plane, so I called her on my cell phone. She answered and said, Hey, honey, guess who's flying to Los Angeles for dinner tonight? The plane is due in St. Louis tomorrow, so I'll be dropped off at the next stop on the way back. See you tomorrow. And hung up. I ran to her friends and asked what was the matter. They laughed. Shelly will have the best night of her life, fly on a private jet and join the Mile High Club. Having worked in the airline business, I knew what it was like. Sex at an altitude of more than a mile. It was a shock for me. Why did she do this? The girls, seeing my desperation, made fun of me for cuckolding an NFL star on his private jet. One girl said, Tomorrow she will return to you and your boring farm life. But this is a night she will never forget. That's right. She will never forget the divorce that will ruin her life. This caught their attention, and one of them said, For her this is very important. Don't spoil her pleasure. She deserves pleasure. Just deal with it. I hope she has fun, because it will be hell for her when she comes back to my house. Then I left, because I didn't need to hear anything more about what my now-cheating wife was doing. I went to Home Depot and bought a dozen different sized boxes to fill with her crap. I took an Uber to the airport and took her car home to load the boxes. She will have to get home herself. Later I received a message from Shelley. It was a very candid photo. The signature was like this. Hey, Bobby, having a great time. Too bad you're not here. The next morning, I called my boss and asked if I could take a few hours off to do some important work. He said yes, and I called the guy who advertised divorce lawyers the most on television to set up a meeting. The guy I met wasn't the big boss, but he was a young man who seemed smart and had a good understanding of what happens when a wife cheats and a husband wants a divorce. He said, It's a simple mathematical equation. She gets 90% of the property, and you get 10% of what you two had. Additionally, since you have two sons, you will be paying her 35% of your salary for child support. I've looked at your tax returns and payment schedule. 
and you're both just trying to make ends meet right now. In case of divorce, you will pay the same bills so that she lives in your house, and you get what is left, which is not much. He continued, Bobby, you're going to need a second job to pay your rent and be able to eat inexpensively. Since she will only receive a portion of your salary, extra things for your boys will be hard to come by. Things like sports uniforms, camps, bikes, will be additional expenses that both of you will not be able to buy. She can live in the house with your boys and sleep with every guy who comes. So I'm completely screwed, I lamented. Is there anything I can do? Put your egos on the shelf and wait until the boys are at least 14, he said. Then they can choose who they want to live with. From what you told me, they would prefer to live with you. Then divorce her. It will still be expensive, but you won't have to pay alimony. Your salaries aren't that far apart, so child support won't be unaffordable. Here's a fight plan for you. Don't scream, yell, or threaten her. This will only strengthen her position in court. Buy a small voice recorder and record every meaningful conversation you can. You can kick her out of the house for a few days, but she has rights to this house. She can return to it by court order, so don't block her. Don't have sex with her until she has passed a complete and humiliating battery of tests. Continuing, he said, Using history as an example, we can say that if she changed now, she will definitely change again. We will use this to our advantage. You cannot use adultery as a reason for divorce. However, if she wants to return to you, demand a conclusion post of marriage, a contract that will say that everyone who cheats, including you, will receive nothing in the divorce and will have custody of the boys. Now you have two ways to get out of this mess. None of them are quick or easy. I will work with you on any specific items you want included in the agreement if you go this route. There's a fine line to walk to make it sound like you don't want her back, but at the same time, you'll allow her to come back with a marriage agreement. So, be careful. If she hires a good lawyer, if you make me angry, you may find yourself in a difficult position for several years. So be careful. If she decides she doesn't want to get back to you, then you'll be giving me and her most of your salary for years to come. My first thought was, thank you for doing this at least. Now my main goal in life was to protect my boys from becoming victims of the divorce war. I had to do everything possible to get custody of them. I had to take them away from that selfish bitch. If I had to play the role of a compliant cuckold husband, I would do it for a short time. It wasn't what I wanted, but it was the only thing I could do to get them away from her. When I cooled down, I realized that I would follow his advice, but only after I tell her how much she hurt me. I loved her, and she did this to me. Last night I was tempted to destroy everything valuable that belonged to her. It's good that I didn't do this. I swore that she would be destroyed, but I had to hold my horses. We were taught in basic training in the army that the greatest test of patience is to wait until the enemy is unknowingly completely within the killing range of your ambush before opening fire. I needed to make two plans for the ambush, since Lance would also be ambushed. I returned home from work a little earlier than she did. As soon as she walked through the door, she asked furiously, why did you drive my car home and not come to meet me? Didn't you receive my messages? It was a hassle to get home, and I don't appreciate it. I turned off my phone so I wouldn't receive your disgusting messages. Sit down with me and tell me about your trip. I moved to an easy chair so she couldn't sit next to me. She said joyfully, It was a great trip. The takeoff was fast and hot. We gained altitude very quickly. The pilot was flying south from Denver, so I could see both the sunset over the Rockies and the lights of Denver. It was very interesting to watch the Earth rush by. I had a great time. You'll like Lance. He's a great guy. I talked to your girlfriends on the committee, and they told me that you were going to become a member of the Mile High Club on this flight. Have you become a member of the club? Her face froze for a second as she thought of what to say. What is the Mile High Club? she asked. You know, it's a club you can join after you've had sex on a plane over a mile high. So are you a member of this club now? Stuttering, she said. Oh, God, no. 
Lance was a true gentleman. He knew that I was married to a wonderful man and would not cheat on him. Why did your friends tell me that you were going to join the Mile High Club and you said that you don't know what it is? Collecting her thoughts, she replied, I don't know why they said that. There was nothing like that. So you didn't have sex with Lance? She answered harshly, No, it wasn't, and this question outrages me. Do you think I'm lying to you? Did you kiss him? She quickly replied, Yes, I just kissed her on the cheek. Then, let me clear things up. The only time you kissed him was to peck him on the cheek. You didn't know about the Mile High Club. You didn't plan on sleeping with an NFL star on his private jet on your way to Los Angeles. You didn't have sex with him or anyone else on any of the plane rides. This is true? She sat up straight and said, This is true. I'm not lying to you. I love you, and I'm offended that you doubt me. Sorry, honey. Instead of doubting your honesty... Let's look at the photos sent to me from your cell phone. A worried look appeared on her face, and she tried to get up to go for cover when I said, Here, my dear, is a photograph of you and Gentleman Lance. Or is that not you in the photo? The blood drained from her face. My God. Where did you take it? Oh, Bobby, I'm so sorry. That's just terrible. No, baby. This is just the beginning of all the terrible things that happened. That's what's terrible. This is terrible. She fell to the floor in a puddle, sobbing and sobbing. I sat as still as a stone, giving her the opportunity to realize all the consequences. Between sobs, she said, You shouldn't have received those photos. They are intended only for me, as a reminder of an unforgettable evening. He must have used my phone to send them to you. I didn't write these terrible things to you. Then that's even worse, isn't it, Shell? I'm the cuckold, and you keep the memorabilia. For the rest of your life, you will be able to experience the best sex of your life looking at these photos, and at the same time, lie to me that you didn't sleep with him. You treat me like just another stupid husband who adores his wife even if she's sleeping with some guy she just met. What a sad situation for both of us. Don't you love me anymore? Am I such a bad lover that you would do this to our marriage? Now, sobbing uncontrollably, she babbled, no, no. It wasn't like that at all. This was my exciting adventure. This was not an attempt to cuckold you or humiliate you. I was just doing something interesting and it had nothing to do with our marriage. Well, that would mean that your marriage is over as a result of your great adventure. When the plane door slammed shut, it closed our marriage and our family. She cried, Our marriage shouldn't suffer. I know I made a mistake and will never do it again. We can get through this. We just have to love each other enough to keep it. I stood up and said, I don't know how we will do this. Your clothes are already in the car. You and I can't be together right now. You need to go somewhere for a few days until we understand what will happen next. Honestly, I can't stand the sight of you right now. Please go away. But this is my home too, she sobbed. Yes, this is your home. But if you want to save your marriage, you better leave for a few days. If you don't do this, then with a mood like mine, I will immediately go to a lawyer to get a divorce. I give myself a chance to cool down. If you want a divorce, then let's get the dueling lawyers lined up against each other for a bloodbath. Bobby, I have nowhere to go. I don't want to get a divorce. I want to stay with you. I will never do anything like that again. You have your girlfriends who encouraged you to get on the plane. You can tell them about the one night you spent and when you returned, you faced hell for life. They will be interested in hearing this story. She shook her head. Okay, I'll do that. But please remember, I love you, Bobby. A fun way to show your love for someone. She blew her nose, wiped her eyes, and asked, Can I call you tomorrow? Of course, I said, but I didn't agree to answer that phone number if I didn't want to. The following week, that afternoon, conversation was repeated. She said she loved me and wanted to get back together. I said it was hard for me to just accept her back into my home. That evening, I began my plan to balance the scales. It took three evenings to complete the project. I wrote to Shelley and suggested we go out to dinner and talk about everything except our marital problems. She gladly accepted my invitation. 
Every word we uttered was checked by the interlocutor to see if it was a veiled threat or an attack. She wanted to come back to our home, but that didn't happen. We parked outside her friend's apartment and I said we needed to discuss something. She searched my face for good or bad news. Shelly, no matter what happens to our marriage, you need to get tested for diseases, for the sake of your health and taking care of the boys. That's not necessary, she replied, since both guys were good clean men. I'm not going to trust the health of our sons with your opinion of good clean guys. If you fail the test, I will get a restraining order to keep you away from them. She took this as concern for our boys and not as humiliation of her. Although this was exactly my plan. Since you haven't told me anything about your plane ride, I want to see the results of these tests. You'll have to work hard to get me to trust you again. You understand? Yes, I understand. If the circumstances were reversed, I would have done the same. Two days later, she called and asked to come in for a few minutes. I agreed and opened the door when she knocked. With all the shame that was heaped on her head, she handed me the tests. The tests showed a positive result for the disease. I was delighted, but I couldn't show it. This greatly improved my situation when I was incarcerated, post of marriage contract. All I could say was, oh, Shelley, but I said it very sadly. She tried to hug me. I pushed her away. Not until you are clean. Bloodshot eyes looked at my face. She nodded and, with tears in her eyes, walked out the front door. The next time I saw her, she came to my house to show me her clean exam. It was very hard for her that this happened, and she was not so persistent in inviting me to resume the relationship. She suggested that I go to the lake with friends to change the environment and topics of conversation. I agreed, because I was ready to pour a bucket of shit on her. So we came to where this story began. I turned to the nasty sister Shelley. Shut up. The more you open your filthy mouth, the less I want to be involved with anyone in your family. Shelley, tell her to shut up, or you and I won't talk until Christmas. At this, Shelley went up to her sister, put her finger on her saggy, thick breasts, and said, Shut up. You're only making things worse. When the noise on the boat died down, I stood up. I'll go take a swim to cool off. With these words, I pulled off my T-shirt and heard Shelley gasping. Oh, God, she exclaimed. On the left side of my chest, I had a large tattoo of a bright red heart. Around the top of the heart was written, My Only True Love. Shelley thought I did it to prove my love for her. Instead, inside the heart were three letters, an an. I stood and watched as she vomited overboard. She stood up, came up to me, and touched my heart. How could you do this to me? I can ask the same thing of you, Shelley. How could you do this to me? She stuttered. How can I look at this when you make love to me? Just like I can look at you with a tattoo in my head about your betrayal. Which is worse? Can you feel my pain now? Now I can be the one who says, just deal with it. Thus ended what should have been a neutral meeting. Shelley and I started marriage counseling, and it was the same conversations we'd been having for weeks. No solution to the main problem between us. She is now in clean health and wants to return to the house. I told her I agree, but we need to make a deal after marriage to be clear about what we expect from each other. I met with my lawyer and outlined my requirements to him. My wording was as follows. In exchange for Bobby not filing for divorce due to Shelley's infidelity with Lance Belton and others, Shelley agrees to the following. One never talk about Lance Belton, two. Shelley won't lead with Belton no written. Oral or electronic correspondence. Three, Bobby agrees to never insult Shelley or make other derogatory comments. Four, both parties will make honest attempts to restore their relationship after Shelley's betrayal. Five, Shelley will be tested for diseases at three-month intervals for nine months. Six, both parties agree that if either party commits adultery, that party will relinquish all rights to home ownership, joint accounts, child custody, and child support. Seven, Shelley pledges to always tell the truth and never lie to Bobby. My lawyer told me it's a very humiliating marriage post-contract, and had Shelley had adequate legal representation, it would have been rejected. I told him that I thought she was willing to agree to everything I listed, 
He polished the contract to get another $1,000. I presented it to Shelley, and she readily signed it. I could include a clause in the contract that she will not associate with her slutty friends. I didn't do it because I wanted to give her a chance to cheat on me again, and then I would cut her out of my life. She will not have the opportunity to set my sons on me. She was glad that I helped her move her things into the house. There are only three bedrooms in our house, and the boys have by bedroom. A dilemma arose about how we should sleep. We wanted to appear in a good light, in front of the boys, but I didn't want to sleep next to her. Once again, I looked at the end goal of getting her out of my life, rather than the short-term pain of sleeping next to her. I hoped that having Anne tattooed on my chest would discourage anyone from getting close to me. I left Friday night for Clear Creek and returned home Monday morning, which eliminated three of the seven nights with her. The remaining four nights I had to endure. She tried in every possible way to force me to make love. I refused her, saying, Not yet. Let's take it step by step. Let time help us heal this. I lied. One morning, I had to deliver a part to an aircraft being serviced at the airport, and I saw this. This was asshole Lance's plane. I went over and talked to the guys I knew in that hangar. They confirmed that it was his plane and he was on it. I decided to look at the plane late that evening and see what I could do to make his life, or what was left of it, miserable. I knew I couldn't handle him man to man, or even man with a heavy wrench to man. He was a big strong man. Having failed to develop a plan, I returned to the hangar at 9 p.m. to see if there were any weak points that I could exploit. I was surprised when I saw the light in the cabin, but the door would break down. I found a rolling ladder and pushed through close enough to see what's going on in the cockpit. He was sitting in front of his computer. From what I saw, it was a paradise for perverts, with lots of video footage. Now I had a plan. I took a video of what I saw and immediately went to the police station. They were fully armed and called a judge to obtain a search warrant that evening. I went on a raid with them to show where his plane was and how to get close to it without him seeing them. When the police were on the scene, I retreated because I didn't want him to know that I was involved. The police attacked him from all sides. Two police officers on the rolling ladder were filming his computer before opening the cabin door. They confiscated the computer and took him to jail. It was all over the news, and I know Shelley saw it but never commented. Same as me. She asked me if I was near his plane that night when I was working late. I shrugged, and she said, I hope Lance rots in hell. I said the same thing. Influenced by Shelley's friends and my sexual rejection of her, it didn't take long before she was caught cheating again. She had to return to the clinic to get rid of her diseases again. My lawyer had correctly assessed her. She was going to cheat again and now I had her at gunpoint. After I showed Shelly the video, she began to hyperventilate and sank into a chair. I didn't have to say anything. I told her, call your girlfriends and have them come and take your shit out of my house. The next day, three vile women showed up to help Shelly remove her things. I didn't want to miss this outcome. Plus, I didn't trust them not to take and destroy my things. I was the center of their arrogant anger. A bleached blonde with plastic breasts snapped, you have to be the biggest jerk in the world to push a woman who loves you out into the street. Laughing, I said, she decided to sleep with someone else, as she wanted, but promised not to do it. She knew the rules and fucked up her marriage. Now she will have to deal with the consequences. At the airport, you told me, deal with it. This is how I come to terms with it. I'm kicking her ass out of my life and out of my marriage. She had an annoyed look on her face because she knew I was right. We were supposed to meet at my lawyer's office to sign the divorce, deed of deed, and custody papers. Shelley took a lawyer with her to challenge everything we had already signed. He ranted, puffed, puffed, and exclaimed, This marriage post, the agreement, is just a disgrace. This is simply a humiliating tirade from a bitter, vindictive man. He's worth nothing. My lawyer looked at me and said, you are right. This agreement is humiliating for both parties. It is disgusting and offensive. But no matter how disgusting it is, it is still legal. This is what you and I do every day. Taking something shameful and disgusting and making it legal. So let's get this over with.
I left the meeting with Shelley sobbing and wailing in the conference room. My house, my children, my marriage. Please don't take all this away from me. I'll have nothing left. Please, I beg you. Please, this may be the last I hear from her. Hope. Carter and Tyler began talking to me about moving to Clear Creek permanently. I didn't mind it, but I needed to talk to Pat and Bill first. Shelley disappeared from my life and I took the boys to Clear Creek on Friday night. I told Pete and Bill the whole story and the fact that we are now divorced. They were very disappointed with Shelley, but were glad that their three boys were not too hurt. That's right, we were now their three boys. As we drove through the pastures, Bill and I discussed moving into a camper and me becoming an employee of Clear Creek. Bill smiled his wise smile and said, it's interesting that you brought this up. Pat and I discussed this before, and we were going to talk to you about it. We'd love for you three guys to live on the ranch permanently. We shook hands and continued our conversations. The next afternoon, I was particularly dirty from working in the workshop, and Pat came out to check on me. I held my shirt under the tap to clean it and make it cooler when it entered the workshop. She stopped for a moment, widened her eyes, and silently walked towards me. Stopping a meter away from me, she put her hand on my tattoo, my only tattoo, which said that her daughter is my one and only love. She hugged the sweaty, foul-smelling me. She said softly, she was so lucky to have a man who loved her so much. Yes, I really loved her and miss her very much. She turned and walked towards the house, holding the napkin to her eyes. When the boys finished school, we sold the house in Wichita and moved into a barracks. Both boys had their own rooms, and the third room was converted into a television family room. We didn't need a kitchen since Pat did the cooking. Shelley kept in touch with the boys via email and phone calls. I had absolutely no contact with her. Carter was old enough to drive on limited farm errands. It was amazing how many places he could find to run farm errands. Both boys enjoyed socializing with the neighborhood kids. Amber Reynolds' name seemed to come up in conversations about where Carter went and who he was with. Do you know her parents? I asked him. Yes, she is one of my teachers, and her father was a veterinarian, but he died two years ago. And her mom is cool. It was an encyclopedia of information received from Carter. Near the end of summer, surrounding ranchers held their annual barbecue. Now I knew most ranchers, so I felt at home at the party. Standing by the beer tank, I saw a woman who was looking in the other direction and, as it seemed to me, was Anne. It couldn't be, but she looked like her. I started moving towards her. She turned, saw me, and smiled. I smiled back and realized that she was of Hispanic descent and was definitely not a clone of Anne. Someone touched her hand and she turned to talk to him. I left, glad that I had not disgraced myself. After a while, Carter and Amber asked me to come over and meet her mother, Emily. I readily agreed. It turned out that the Latina was Amber's mother. Up close, she turned out to be a very pretty woman with facial features similar to Anne's. We found a common language and continued to communicate after the children left us. We even danced together a few times. As we were leaving the concrete dance floor, I saw Pat coming towards us. She walked arm in arm with another woman, both smiling broadly. I wonder what Pat has in store for me, I asked Emily. How do you know Pat? Emily answered. She's my mother-in-law, and I live in their house with my boys. Then you must be him, she almost screamed. Who is he? I stuttered. The one who married Anne. I was cousin Anne's bridesmaid at your wedding. The woman with Aunt Pat is my mother, Mary Hernandez. Mary and Pat are sisters. Oh my God, that's why your son's name is Carter, right? She called her mother. Mom, Mom, this is him. Mom, Anne's husband. I finally found it. Emily turned to me and said, Let me look at her. What to see? I asked. A tattoo. A tattoo of love for Anne. Please let me see. I undid the buttons on my shirt. An electric charge passed through both of us. There was a very strong connection between us. We both looked into each other's eyes and realized that we were connected. I see you have finally found each other, Pat said. We hoped you would do it yourself so you wouldn't think we set it up. All of a sudden, I realized that we were holding hands. Pat grabbed my unbuttoned shirt and turned to Emily and said, 
You and Anne are so similar. You can't help but try to undress this man. We all howled with laughter at her remark. I wasn't trying to create a new Anne, and she wasn't looking for a clone of her late husband. We really began to care and love each other as we are, and not as we lacked in our late spouse. The following July, Emily and I rode horses to a special place to observe behind the Perseid meteor shower. This place was familiar to her. As we sat on the blanket, hugging each other, I reached into my pocket and pulled out a small box. Emily, my love for you is so deep in my soul that I must be with you every day. Please marry me. Oh, Bobby, I really want to marry you. You are the best man for me in the entire universe. We kissed and lay on our backs to hold each other, knowing that where we went next would be special to us. Suddenly she shouted, Look! It happened again. The first time I saw it was when I proposed to Anne, two stars with a cloud smiling broadly. Bobby and Emily married that fall, and Bobby moved into Emily's house. For the first time in almost 20 years, there was no one left in the house. That was until Carter received a university degree in animal husbandry and production management and moved into the cabin. He liked to have privacy, especially when Amber came to visit. A year later, Carter and Amber brought the Smith and Carter families back together. When they had children, they moved into Pat and Bill's house when they moved into town to a nursing home. Bill still goes to Clear Creek every day to check in and remind himself. Tyler comes to the ranch to harvest wheat, hunt pheasants, and celebrate the holidays. He has a steady girlfriend and lives in Kansas City where they both have jobs. Bill and Pat provided funds for two of their grandchildren to receive college degrees. Both sons will visit their mother for holidays and birthdays. She married a man who retired from the U.S. Postal Department. The boys think she is happy now. Lancey Belton pleaded guilty instead of going to trial because he did not want the investigation into his reprehensible activities to continue. He received 12 years in prison in a place he did not like. Pat and Bill transferred their interests in Clear Creek Ranch, Inky, Bobby, Carter, and Tiller 33.3% each. Clear Creek pays Bill a consultant's fee to take care of all their nursing home needs. Bobby and Emily are completely in love with each other and the way their lives have turned out. They both had to endure pain and grief, but they found a way to push them into the background. Bobby's tattoo didn't stop Emily from loving him, even though he had her cousin's name written on his chest. She happily tells her friends that over the years, she has tried more than a thousand times to tell herself that this bothered her during sex with Bobby, but it didn't bother her at all. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.